I won't mention that. <laughs> but that was terrific. And um, what we've discovered, there are so many people from different political parties who care with right passion about the issue. But it all comes back to what Nathan said at the end. Who runs the country? And it's no good being in fact an MP if we're just like a county councillor. Um, two things I forgot to say. <laughs> One at the end, we like to take a photograph, so please don't run off. Please come up the front and we'll, we'll take a group photograph and it, it goes around on that sort of thing called Twitter and stuff like that. And it may also finish up in, in, in a paper. And the second so, thing so is... So you meant to be at work like that. Yes, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question I always get asked later, so I, I will say it now, is why we go and not vote leave? Well, it's a technical issue. There are actually 46 leading groups, and only one remains, so I guess we're winning 46 to one. The problem is the rules. The government has done everything it can to make it impossible for the lead campaign to properly fund what it needs to do. Um, the lead campaign gets £7 million in total, if we can raise it, if we can get people to vote lead, gets £7 million, if they can raise it. The government, on its own, spent £9.3 million pounds putting a propaganda leaflet through, completely trying to fix it. Some people will say last night's vote, yesterday's vote, on the vote for registration, well, there was no vote, the fact that we extended vote for registration wasn't down on the high principle. It was done because the government thought they would get more uh, remain voters by doing that. So it's all of it's, it's establishment against the people. The one thing they didn't get right was a loophole. So if you are independent of the main designated group, as Go is, we can spend 700,000. So we can spend up to 700,000. Leave.eu and other groups can spend up to 700,000. Labour Leave can spend up to 700,000 on top of the 7 million. So by staying independent, and we're all campaigning for the same thing. We actually get more money to spend on the lead campaign. People always ask me that, and I, I, I just Tom reminded me to say that uh, at, at the beginning. Um, our last speaker, our keynote speaker, is your member of parliament, uh, David Dacre. Do, do, they, do they call you David TC
And there are a lot of us in this room who are working very hard at the moment. And it would be a huge mistake, actually, to single anyone out, but I'll make that. And I've got to say, Callum Soap has done a fantastic job. <laughs> Please come and join us because we really are about to make history. I, I mean, everything Nathan said was absolutely right. We are winning the battle out there, the battle for hearts and minds. And it's quite obvious there's been a mood change in the public over the last few weeks. And I really do think we're going to do this, if we're going to make history. I can uh, honestly say I was one of the original rebels with Peter, who voted one of the 81, I think, of us, who voted for this referendum many years ago. We got there uh, in the end, but I can trace my own scepticism back to the 1990s, just before the Welsh Assembly was set up. We had a big meeting for candidates and people who wanted to become part of the Welsh Assembly in a room in Cardiff. And a German came along, and he worked for the European Union. He actually worked for one of the delegations that represented one of the German states. And he said, I won't do the German accent because some of you will think I'm being offended. <laughs> and he said, uh, it's very important. The first thing you do when you get your Welsh Assembly set up, he said, is to set up a delegation from Wales to go out in Brussels. And he said, the reason for that is that very often, he said, you're putting for, uh, for grants for things. And he said, sometimes you won't get accepted. And he said, it's no problem. What I do when this happens is I ring up the appropriate official and I take him out to dinner. I only went with this story. He said, not just any old dinner, it's a very good dinner, ha ha, he said. <laughs> and he said, we don't talk about matter of business at all. He said, of course we're not. We're civilised Europeans. We, we enjoy the fine food and the wines. And he said, perhaps over the brandy and the cigars, and this was back in the 90s when they presumably still had them. He said, I, I put my proposition for a grant in, and it usually gets accepted. No problem at all. And I got out in disbelief. And I said, are you seriously telling me that we now have to spend a chunk of taxpayers' money in Wales, paying for a whole load of people to go out to Brussels, in order to wine and dine other people, in order to get back a little chunk of the money that we've given them, our taxpayers' money, <laughs> after you've had a fine meal and a whole load of brandies and cigars. And of course, uh, he didn't think it was very good, and he said, young man, you, you know, you've got a thing or two to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing I've learned ever since then has changed my basic view that this is a corrupt and undemocratic organisation, and we need to get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> a week is an accurate figure. That is what we pay to be in the European Union. Yes, we get some of it back. They tell us what to do with it. They, uh, and they fine us if we get it wrong. But I find actually one of the most insulting things is that they actually make us put up these ridiculous signs everywhere saying, this project was paid for by the European Union. No, it wasn't. It was paid for by us. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised somebody hasn't gone around and actually put little stickers on them saying, you know, this project was actually paid for by British taxpayers. I don't want to encourage anyone to break the law. <laughs> you know, if anyone has that idea. I'm very concerned about immigration. Yes, I'm married to somebody who's immigrated to this country. And, and by the way, I think it's outrageous that people have suggested there is any racism or xenophobia in this campaign because I've been campaigning with everyone here, with UKIP, with conservatives, with people of no political background at all. There is no racism and no xenophobia, but of course there is a perfectly legitimate concern about the very large numbers of people who are coming into this country. And we have a right to be concerned about that. I think we have another right as well, and it's a bit more sensitive, but it does need to be said, and I put it on the record with the press here. We have a right to say that if people are going to come into this country, of course they should learn to speak English. Of course they should be doing the job of work, and of course they should be respecting our values. And it is disgraceful that we're allowing people to come over here, not to take on jobs, to give people benefits, to pay out benefits for people who aren't even living in this country when it comes to child benefit, we're supplying interpreters for people who turn up here to use and make use of NHS treatments like IVF, which wouldn't even be available in their own country. I mean, we're paying for it, and we're providing the interpreters as well. We can't discriminate against somebody who's arrived here for five minutes and somebody who's been here all their life and who's in need of social housing, and that is wrong. And most worryingly of all, if we allow Turkey to come in to the European Union, we will be accepting that there will be potentially millions of people who want to come here who have very different fundamental values to us. Now, I don't care what colour somebody's skin is or what their religion is, it's of no interest to me at all. 
the more the merrier. I said, first, we have a right to expect that people understand that there are fundamental values in Britain. For example, I look at what's happened uh, in terms of the illegal migration into the European Union. And I, as a member of another organisation that we need to have a look at, actually, called the Council of Europe, I've been out and visited migrant camps in Germany, in uh, Hungary, in Greece, and also the one in Calais. And the things I've learned that you won't read in the press, that first of all, the vast majority of people coming in are young men, fit and able young men, between 18 and 30. And if they're really fleeing war and, uh, uh, and the rest of it, you have to ask yourself, well, what's happened to the, their wives and their mothers? Why have they been left behind? The vast majority, in reality, are looking for a better standard of living. And they're coming from countries which have very different values when it comes to things like women's rights. <coughs> and that's why we see the most appalling situations going on, not just in Cologne, where thousands of women were sexually assaulted by groups of men with different cultural values. We've seen it in Sweden, where women have been told <coughs> in one city that their safety can no longer be guaranteed when they walk the streets. We've seen it in towns in Germany, in one place in Pocking in Bavaria. Uh, this school wrote to parents and said, in future when your daughters walk around, can you ensure that they're modestly dressed at all times because some of the newcomers here uh, do not understand <coughs> their right to walk around with bare arms or whatever. So people are being asked to change the way that they behave. Women are finding their own freedom to wear what they want or walk where they want, being restricted in order to avoid what are called cultural misunderstandings with people coming in here. I think it's outrageous, and I think we need to be, we have perfectly within our rights to talk about this. Yeah. Can I say, actually, I've met recently with a group of Muslim women from London who said to me, you must do more to raise this issue, because the women who are suffering here are women from minority communities, in some cases the Muslim community. And they said the real racists are the ones who are stopping you from raising this issue. The real fascists are the ones on the left who are preventing us from raising our own concerns. Yeah. 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 So we've got, to get, we've got to get immigration under control, and we can do that if we leave the European Union, because we will no longer be subject to the outrageous so-called human rights legislation, which usually comes with a, with a whole load of lawyers as well, arguing that terrorists and, and all sorts of other near new worlds have got some sort of God-given right to stay in this country. But the most important thing for me, of course, is, is uh, the issue that's been mentioned by so many others, and that's about democracy and sovereignty. I believe that if people are elected to pass our laws, they should be based in this country. If the laws are affecting Britain, they should be made by people who are based in Britain. I believe that it's a good thing that every four to five years, you know, I have to come around, I have to knock on your doors. You probably all say, oh, no, not him again, you know. What's he want to have television talk? You look at the blue rose, I know I've seen that happen. But you know, the reality is that it's a good thing that politicians have to go out and ask for their jobs every four to five years because it concentrates our mind for the rest of the period that, that we're in office. The European commissioners don't have to ask anyone for their jobs. Nobody even knows who they were. I mean, you mentioned Lord Hillwood, the British commissioner, apparently been a member of the Conservative Party for 17 years. I've never heard of him. I don't know who he is. Would recognise him if, if I crossed him uh, in the street. You don't know who any of these people are, and yet they have so much power, making more than 50 percent of our law, according to the House of Commons in my room. So it's time that we got control once again of the people who make those laws. And the only way that we can do that is to leave the European Union. It's not a vote against other European people. It's not a vote against other European countries. It is a vote against, frankly, big business, the unions, the people, the powerful NGOs who are able to lobby within Brussels. It is a vote against the political establishment of all parties, not just in this country, but in countries across the rest of the European Union, many of whose own peoples are crying out for the same referendum that we're having at the moment. And most of all, it's a vote to get back control of our money, to get back control of our borders, and to get back control of the people who make our laws. Now, the reason you mentioned Henry V, what a great hero he was, because you probably didn't know this, Nathan, but he was actually born just across the road in Monmouth Castle. I didn't know that. And uh, he was a great British king. I mean, the man of Wales, I think uh, I'm Welsh. Uh, don't you know I'm Welsh? was one of the, the quotes from Shakespeare. I'm thinking hard now. Uh, but he was a great British king. And you were right about the archers. I believe there were eight or nine thousand um, 
on the British side. Most of the marchers, most of them coming from Monmouthshire and Herefordshire as well, to be fair, and at least 30,000 on the other side. So you see, there it was, surrounded by his European enemies, with people telling him that you can't possibly win. And he inspired them by making a speech where he told them that if they went out and fought the next day, St. Crispin's Day, they would be remembered for hundreds of years, not just Henry V, but Gloucester, uh, York, and all the others who had taken part in that battle. Now, Davis thinks very quickly back to his days in school. I believe that it went something on the lines of this. <laughs> An Englishman who lie abed shall curse the day they were not here and hold their manners cheap. I'm not sure what that referred to. <laughs> well, say so he speak. Who fought with us on referendum day? <laughs> I think we should take some inspiration from this. And when people tell us it can't be done, remember the polls are now saying it's 50 50 all the way. We've got 10 days to go. So if you're not already signed up with Calvin, please come and see us afterwards. We're going to be out there again delivering leaflets. We're going to be canvassing, we're going to be manning the stands, we're all going down to Cardiff on Sunday, where the stink from Top Gear is coming to grace us with his presence at midday. We've got 10 days left to change the course of history in this country. Come and join us and be part of it. Thank you for being a bit audience. We're going to take some questions and answers.